All right, second slide show. This will go a little quicker. This will go a little quicker. Talking about Portland cement, some Portland cement concrete and asphalt concrete. Um, asphalt concrete is in the review or in the uh, supplied reference. Uh, I have yet to be able to find an example, um, a free review problem that deals with asphalt. But it's in the book. So if it's in the book, we need to make sure we know how to deal with it. Um, remember the different components for dealing with cement. If we've got cement and water, it's, it's cement paste. We've got cement paste and sand, it's mortar. Add some aggregate in there, we call it concrete. Uh, we've got some different different volumes, uh, ratios there. Portland cement, you know, seven and a half to 15 percent, uh, 60 to 70 percent aggregate, uh, one to 15 percent, although it's really probably more like one to seven or eight percent air. Water's going to vary, and of course the admixtures are very, very negligible in their volumes. But that's what it takes to put together a decent concrete. Specific gravity of, of all cements are uh, 3.15, um, we do everything in weights because it bulks so badly because of air content. When we look at hydration, um, that's um, the chemical reaction between the cement itself and the water, and that's uh, um, going to produce all different chemicals, different reactions, and get the bonding or the glue, if you will, to turn concrete into concrete. Um, when we look at the voids that are in our concrete, uh, we've got entrapped air and entrained air. We like the entrapped air, or we like the entrained air. We don't like the entrapped air. The entrapped air is usually bigger in size, and it's gotten into the concrete by the handling and placement process. Uh, entrained air is, is very, very small micro bubbles that we like. Um, like those sizes, it helps with our durability uh, and, and long-term uh, conditions of our concrete. We do the, the Vicat needle test to help us determine uh, the hardening or the setting process of our concrete. We've got an initial contact of the cement and the water. We start our, our clock. We can place the material, handle the material, do our fresh mix property tests with it. And then um, and when we get a Vicat needle penetration of 25%, it tells us we've we're got an initial set for the material. At that time, things are starting to get into a plastic state. We can't move it around and manipulate it. If we do, it's going to be very block, very blocky and won't, won't go back together, if you will. And then we eventually get to our final set with the Vicat needles of zero penetration. Um, but that's the point where um, you can start, you can actually walk on it at that point if you wanted to. And that's the point that hardening begins. We have setting up till this point. Now we're getting hardening. And that's where we'll get our, our curve uh, from our compression test. Water cement ratio is a very, very, very important aspect for our Portland cement concrete, Abrams Law, um, and he realized that the ratio of water and cement were the key element in designing a concrete mix. For hydration to occur, you need between 0.22 and 0.25 percent water with respect to the cement content. Um, Typically, though, in real concrete, we've got um, water cement ratio is somewhere, ration, ratio is between 0.4 and 0.7 percent. And we've got that so that we have workability. The 0.22 to 0.25 gets us the hydration to occur so we get our strength. The excess beyond that is so we can work it and manipulate it and move it. Yes, sir. Oh, really? Well, you guys should have done a better job of copying. Or 15 or 16. 11 and 12, we finished with one. And it looks like every other, every other class 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 class. Holy cow. Let's hang on here now. That's OK, though. I think we can keep it as we do, and then get some other class. Hard, hard, hard. Um, so you gotta, you got to keep those two, com those two sets of numbers separate in your mind. Um, one's for hydration. And one's for typical concrete, so we have workability, extra water for workability. Uh, water cement ratio, like I say, is very critical for us. Um, as the water cement ratio gets higher, i.e., we get more water in there than we should have, 
decreases strength, decreases durability, decreases bond between layers, decreases bond between the concrete and the rebar, it increases the permeability, and it increases the chance for volume change. It does absolutely everything wrong we don't want to happen to our concrete. So we really got to keep track of our water cement ratio. Diagrams, and these are diagrams that are in the book that could ask questions about this. As, as water cement ratio decreases, our compressive strengths increase. And we can see on here, if we look at the chart on the right, we can see how our compressive strength increases if we had a 0.45, oops, if we had a 0.45, okay, hmm. see what we can get going here, should we now make it work? You're seeing that too, right? That's frustrating. All right. If we had a 0.45 water cement ratio and we drew a vertical line up from that point, we could see what our compressive strengths would be for day one, day three, day seven, and day 28. In the real world, we typically think about our strengths and talk about our strengths in terms of 28-day strengths. But we could, with this chart, after three or seven days, plot it and say, if we're getting the strengths we ought to be getting, because it ought to plot right. It ought to plot right on here. Got different types of cement, and I have seen questions like this. Um, of, of, you know, they'll give you the different types of cements, and they'll say, which one should you use for this application? Um, you got type 1, type 2, type, type 1, 2, which is a combination you see more and more these days. Uh, type 2 is for moderate sulfate issues. Um, we got a high early strength, so we get our compressive strength quicker, so we can maybe take forms off earlier speed up production if we're doing slip form operations. Uh, we have low heat of hydration kind of cement so that if we're casting something big, this help keeps, helps keep the heat down because heat's our enemy during the, the curing process, or the heating, uh, the, um, the uh, hardening process. Uh, and we got high sulfate resistance, so if you have high sulfate issues, and you put those in there uh, for the different application that you're looking at for your particular design. We like, uh, we don't in like entrapped air. It has all the bad effects. We don't want decreases strength, increases permeability because the bubbles are connected. Um, we do like entrained air. We'll talk about that in a little bit more. We have to put water in our, in our Portland cement concrete for hydration. We like to keep that water cement ratio as low as we can because it gives us the highest compressive strength we can get. But we also realize we've got to put some extra water in there for workability. If you can't move and handle the material and get it to consolidate where you want it to be, then it's, there's no benefit to it. You'll frustrate people. So we've got to add enough extra water in there to make things work. Um, so that's how we get that 0 0.4, 0 0.7 um, water cement ratios because we have that extra water in there. We've got water reducers that help us um, get material that can flow well. Um, we can reduce the, the water cement ratio down where we like to get a high compressive strength, and then we can add some water reducers in there. A um, little misnomer in the turn the way it sounds. Um, we're not really reducing the water by putting that in there. It's not reacting with the water, doing anything with the water. Uh, what it does is it allows us to reduce the water we put in the mix. We put some of this in there, uh, a lot of times referred to as Super P, Super Plasticizer, and depending on how much you put in there, um, I wish our pen worked. Yeah, all it's going to do is advance slides. Um, you can see we have uh, no water reducers on the far left there. Um, coming out of the slump cone, it stays in the exact same shape we put it in there when we formed it. Um, we put conventional reducers, mid-range reducers, and of course we put the Super P in there. It's a self-leveling concrete. It flattens out uh, and will travel large distances and will flow around rebar easier and things of that nature. Um, Got to be careful with the Super P, though, that if you get too much in it, then it can cause aggregate segregation because there's not enough solids. It's too fluid, and all the rock just drops to the bottom. And then, uh, then you don't get good uniform concrete like we like to have. Got a retarder. That, ha that deals with our set time. That deals with our set time. It can delay or retard the set so we can work with it longer. 
haul it farther distances, move it farther on the job site, things of that nature. Um, we've got things to help control the hydration. We can actually stop it, restart it if we'd like to. Here again, if you're on a job site, something goes wrong, you've got long travel times, you want to do that so the material doesn't go into that, uh, into the set process, setting process too quickly. We can put accelerators in here to speed up the initial and final set time. Um, if you want to go make things go faster, you can put those in there and get to that rigid, rigid, rigid state uh, quicker. Doesn't affect your compressive strength at all. That doesn't change at all. It's just how fast you get to the hardening process beginning. And calcium chloride is the co most common additive to cause that to occur. There's add mixture for everything you can think of. These are a very, very short list, but you can add stuff in there for workability, for reducing permeability, uh, for color, for reinforcement, to help it pump to a pump truck. Um, you name it, there's an additive that you can put in there if you want to pay for it to be able to handle the concrete in its different methods or forms. We can add flash or slag to the concrete to replace cement because it's cheaper. Because it's cheaper, these actually become and replace the cement. So these are and these are actually included in the weight of your cement for your water cement ratio. So these are actually included in that. Um, at, you know, flash has advantages; it doesn't get real hot. Um, slag has its advantages; it's they're trying to give it away like candy. Um, so both of these and a lot of concretes will have these in there to to help make the concrete more economical, make it keep it a little cooler, and uh, and have the same result, have the same compressive strength when you're done. Silica fume coming off the coal production process. Um, there's other natural materials out there that you can put in there as well. Um, they all can replace the cement, which is your most expensive component. Anytime you can replace that and still have the same product at the end, you want to do it. We got our different mix designs. The one, two, three, you got um, a small or non-critical job scenario. You got by weight method, and you got by absolute volume method. Absolute volume method is a little more difficult, but that's exactly what we want to do. It's exactly what we want to do in our true mix designs. Weight method is pretty good, but it's not as accurate, but it's very easy. Um, arbitrary method one, two, three, can't get any simpler than that. One volume sand. One volume cement, two volumes sand, three volumes coarse aggregate, mix that together, put some water with it, and you got concrete, and that'll give you decent concrete. Um, so depending on what you're, what you're building, if you're out at the farm, one, two, three method works great. If you're running a ready mix concrete plant here in Huntington, you better be doing absolute volume because when somebody buys a yard of concrete, they want to be buying a yard of concrete. And any other methodology could be off just a little bit from that volume standpoint. Examples of the arbitrary method. You can use buckets, shovels, whatever you want to use to make that work. When we're designing our concrete, we're given a design strength we want to target, F prime sub C. We know that concrete's got a variable variability in its strength, and we don't want to design our mix to be F prime sub C because then half the time it'll be acceptable, half the time it won't. So we're going to go back in and define that we want at least 90% of our samples to be good with only 10% being bad. And if we go through this nice little slideshow here, we'll see that if I design to, to 1.34 times the standard deviation added to the compressive strength I want, that's F prime sub CR, which is the center of this bell curve. And that's where I want to design to. And that guarantees I'm going to have 90% of my mix will come out and test properly. So I'm going to accept 10% being off by going through this process. Depending on what your standard deviation is, uh, what equations we're going to use, you want to find your, your, your weight, your water cement ratio. Somebody says I want F prime sub C to be a certain value or F prime sub CR to be a certain value. Go to the simple chart, come over, come down and that'll tell you what your water cement ratio is. This is a graph that's developed over time in your particular facility. It's from your historical records that what you produce historically. So when somebody else somebody, somebody else later on says I want 5,000 
KSI or PSI strength, 5 KSI strength. You can come in with a 5, go across, come down. That tells you what water cement ratio you need to be using in your mix to get the proper compressive strength long term. We correct for our moisture. It's one of the biggest and most important things we can do. If we don't correct for moisture and we have free moisture in our aggregates, extra moisture in our aggregates, then we have to add that water by accident to our water cement ratio. So therefore, we're increasing our water cement ratio means we're decreasing our compressive strength. So you got to watch. Um, you got to watch when you're doing that to make sure that you don't add extra water. If you were, if you had something that was drier than it's supposed to be, then it's going to make your workability rough. It's going to make your workability rough. So in this particular scenario here, in this when we did the design for this slide, we had five, 305 pounds of required water based on the water cement ratio. And based on this chart and looking at the absorption levels for the aggregates, the actual moisture contents today, we, we end up with almost 56 pounds of extra water in the aggregate because it was wetter than saturated surface dry. Therefore, we have to take the 56 pounds off of the 305 pounds and only put in 249 pounds. If we put the 305 in, we would have got the 56 by accident. Our water cement ratio would have tanked on us. It would have tanked on us. The importance of proper curing your concrete. We do all the mix design in the world and get it perfect. But if we don't cure the concrete correctly, this is an indication of what kind of compression strength you're going to get. Cast the concrete, don't do anything for it. Dry it in the air the entire time. When you thought you were going to maybe get a uh, 3,000 PSI concrete, you're going to get 50% of that. Your y-axis here is 50% of the compressive strength at 28 days. So if you wanted, um, if you wanted to get the maximum value out of your concrete, you moist cure it, keep it cure when it's when it's going through its hardening process, and you will get more than 100% of your design strength. So the longer you leave it out, the lower your compressive strengths are going to be. Diagram of compressive strength versus strain. And as you see, we get our water cement ratio 0.33. It's down in that area we like to be at, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. We see nice stress strain curves. <coughs> we don't get a lot of strain before we get our compressive strength. As we get higher and higher water cement ratios, not only do we get lower and lower compressive strengths, it takes longer to get to those compressive strengths. And we don't like that. We don't like that. So rule of thumb, make sure you're keeping your water cement ratio where you want to be. Estimation of, of uh, modulus of elasticity. Here again, it's just in the book. If they give you the F prime sub C, find the equation, you get your modulus of elasticity. Different tests for testing concrete, hardened concrete. We've got destructive and non-destructive. Compressive strength, splitting tensile, flexural strength. Um, we did compressive strength testing in the lab. We did structural, flexural testing with the beam. We did not do splitting tensile, uh, where we set the, the cylinder on the side and, and do it in tension. Um, Non-destructive testing, there's rebound hammers, penetration resistance. Both of those are more of a surface texture, surface hardness, trying to correlate that to the compressive strength of the entire mass, but you're only testing the surface. Um, ultrasonic. Maturity testing, those are two different forms to try to keep track of what your compressive strength is. Uh, maturity testing is really a, a, a long process. You have to do up front. You can't do that post-construction. You have to have done that in the lab prior to going out there. I don't think you're going to see anything on maturity testing on the lab. Compressive strength, putting load on the sample, busting the sample, splitting tensile, put it on its side, measure that load. And we're measuring the tensile capacity. We always talk about concrete not having tensile capacity. It has a very small amount, about 10% usually, of the compressive strength. I've seen questions like that. What, is, what would be the most likely value of the, of the tensile strength for this concrete? And they give you the strength of the concrete, and you have to do the, the quick math, come up with about 10%, and that tells you what the tensile capacity could be. Flexural beam. You've done this in class, three-point loading. Um, asphalt. Like I said, I haven't seen a lot on asphalt, so we'll click through this even faster. 
Um, all, you, you got bituminous materials, asphalt tars. We get most of all our products this day out of asphalt because it's, it's easier to control. We've got cements, cutbacks, and emulsions. Uh, make sure you have a good feel for the difference between those and how they're placed. Uh, various temperature susceptibles, we all realize summertime you see as you feel asphalt getting soft under your feet right so it's very temperature susceptible um, therefore it's very uh, very difficult to design with from the standpoint you got to make sure that it can handle both the cold temperature and the hot temperature in the region you're in the kind of the asphalt concrete you use in Florida is not the same one you're going to use in Minneapolis Minnesota if you take the one the concrete the asphalt concrete from either one of those taken to other places it will fail miserably very very quick um, so you got to make sure you got your your temperature range is properly set for this material to work good. Um, too brittle, you're going to have problems. If it's too soft, you're going to have rutting. So you got to make sure you're, you're in that sweet spot in the middle there. Make sure your grades are set properly. Thermal cracking, that's what you see right there in that one photograph on the, on the left. On the right, you're seeing rutting. And those, those shadows you see there, that's actually tractor trailer truck tires that have rutted that as it rode down the road there. Um, grading systems, I haven't seen anything on any of the exams I've ever seen, uh, example exams I've seen on, on grading, but it's in here because I had it in the class. Um, when we look at how we rate materials nowadays in the asphalt world, it's on performance. It used to be we just had a set of properties and, and we tried to emulate those and we felt that those gave us good results in the field. Nowadays we're going back and looking at it at the specific behaviors we want to see and rating the asphalt based on that and designing based on that. So it's about performance these days, not about the design properties we thought were the right properties. Um, looking at the grades of asphalt, what temperature zones you need to be in, different type of asphalt. Super pave is the new design methodology you've got out there everybody's using. and um, and it's based on performance, based on getting the performance out of the material uh, so it'll last like we'd like to see it when it's placed. Uh, I'm going to jump through this super paved stuff. Like I said, I haven't seen a problem like this on the exam, so we'll, we'll try to move through here a little quicker. Uh, super paved, super paved. So that's everything on, on that particular slideshow. Now the challenge is going to be to see if I can get the screen to work here. So we can record what we're doing. Oh, wait a minute, let's try this. Maybe they've actually got it installed. That doesn't look like what we're after here. There's what we're after right there. there we go. These are all websites. All right, so now we're going to look at a bunch of problems. A lot of this is going to be reading problems and writing them up here on the screen for you. I do have all of these. You're more welcome to copy any of these you want to. Um, if you want to work on them on your own later on.
Let's see, ready mix concrete being delivered to the job site is found to have a slump less than specified. Which of the following is the most appropriate corrective action? Decrease the amount of water in the mix before the truck leaves the ready mix plant. Increase the water in the mix in the truck at the job site before the concrete is poured. We don't use the word poured, right? It's placed. Add an add mixer to the truck at the job site before the concrete is poured. Increase the rotation speed of the mixing drum while the truck is in transit to the job site. Ready mix concrete is delivered to the job site and is found to have a slump less than specified. So it's too stiff. Too stiff. Which of the following is the most appropriate corrective action? Decrease the amount of water in, before it left the plant. Increase the water at the job site. Add an admixture to the truck at the job site. Or increase the rotation speed while it was coming down the street. B is throw the water in the truck at the job site. What has Professor Huffman said 8,000 times? You can if on the ticket it says you're allowed to. And on the ticket sometimes it'll say you can add up to a gallon or two gallons a yard, whatever it might be. Typically it's highly frowned upon to add any water to the job site. Because what are you doing? You're lowering your, your compressive strength. So the proper answer is you need to add an admixture. Uh, 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 maybe you could add in um, a little bit of air and training agent, make it, make it work a little better. You can add a super P agent, a water reducing agent in there, um, and that will help increase the, the fluidity of it so you can actually move it and place it. Oh, that, that when you start looking at at, uh, at adding in some kind of water reducer, um, you can make some thin concrete real quick, real, real quick. Um, we switched, yeah, that, that your guys here, we switched types and it, it was real, it was off the chart. It was chart, off the chart. In general, um, and this way a lot of these materials type questions are going to be enforced. It's just a quick answer. In general, a metal with a high hardness will also have good formability, high impact strength, high electrical conductivity, high yield strength. High yield strength. Correct. Correct. Glass is said to be an amorphous material. This means that has a high melting point, has a super cooled vapor, has a large crystal, a large cubic crystals, and has no apparent crystal structure. Has no apparent crystal structure. You can see through glass, right? You can see through glass. Has no apparent crystal structure. Uh, an aluminum crimped connector used to connect copper to a copper wire to a battery, what would you expect to happen? The copper wire only will corrode. The aluminum connector only will corrode. Both will corrode or nothing. You've got an aluminum crimped connector connecting copper wire to a battery. the aluminum will corrode. The aluminum will corrode. Um, a steel bar is tested in tension at a stress less than the yield strength. At less than the yield strength. The module of elasticity is most nearly axial stress divided by change in length, axial load divided by change in length, Axial stress divided by axial strain. Axial load divided by axial deformation. Stress over strain, right? C. Axial stress divided by axial strain. 
All this junk up front about the steel bar was tested in tension to its yield strength. It has nothing to do with the question. Make sure you read the question. All you need to know, all this question needs to say, the modulus elasticity is most nearly. All the rest of that stuff was fluff to try to confuse you, to try to figure out, so maybe you're trying to use yield strength and you calculate your answer somehow. Plausible distractors. Plausible distractors. You've got to be careful with those. Um, got, uh, ooh, uh, yeah, we're probably going to skip that one. Let's skip that one. Don't want to be here all night, do we? Flipping through these. Um, which of the following properties cannot be determined from a tensile test? So that's Tenny Solson. We're grabbing hold of two ends of it and we're pulling it. What cannot be determined? The modulus, modulus of elasticity, modulus of resilience, endurance limit, ultimate tensile strength. Endurance limit. Because endurance is going to be some kind of taking the paper clip and bending it till it breaks type thing, right? Um, mechanics of materials, mechanics of materials. Um, what do impact tests determine? Hardness, yield strength, toughness, creep strength. What do impact tests hardness? Uh, what is the main difference between cast iron and steel? Won't even read the answers. <laughs> Surely I knew you'd know that one. Surely I would know you'd know that one. Um, Here's a good one. For a fixed curing time, the ultimate strength of the concrete increases with decreasing moisture content, decreases with decreasing moisture content, is independent of the moisture content if cured for a significantly long time, is independent of curing pressure. For a fixed curing time, the ultimate strength of the concrete increases with decreasing water content, decreases with decreasing water content, is independent of the water content if cured long enough, and is independent of curing pressure. Have you ever heard of curing pressure? I never heard of curing pressure either, so we cross that off. First option A. As water content goes down, water cement ratio goes down, compressive strength goes up. The curing pressure, whatever the heck the curing pressure is. It's got curing on the brain. Curing on the brain. See what else we have here. Just think if you could take this test as a group. Couldn't you just crush it? You could just crush it if you could take it as a group. <laughs> you might. You might. Continuous yielding of a material under constant stress is known as failure, strain, creep, or ductility. Continuous yielding of a metal under constant stress is known as, the answers are failure, strain, creep, or ductility. So we've got continuous yielding under constant strain. So I've got increase in strain. I've, come, I've gone up, and then I've got to one stress level, and I've got constant strain moving to the right. So it is, it is a form of yielding, without a doubt. It's creep. We, that's what the definition of creep is. A constant load, and you keep getting that strain over time. Uh, see, the mass of an atom of nickel is most nearly. 
Look at all the faces. <laughs> Sorry. I had to do it. I had to do that one. Somebody does that off the top of their head. Not the civils, right? Do what now? Oh, now you make me have to go back and find it. Um, 2.1 times 10 to the negative 23 grams per atom is one of the answers. I don't know which answer is the correct answer. We're civils. That's close enough for us, right? Let's see here. <laughs> In the civil world, it is. It's not. Oh, more, more, more the same thing. More the same thing. More the same thing. Like I said, there's just not that many. All of the metals, the fo all of the following metals will corrode if immersed in fresh water, except copper, nickel, chromium, aluminum. All of the following materials will corrode if immersed in fresh water, except copper, nickel, chromium, aluminum. You're all wrong. It's copper. Copper. Um, the process of annealing can be used to achieve all of the following except. Annealing can be used to, to achieve all the following except relief stresses, recrystallization, grain growth, or toughness. Well, I was looking at it, and it's like it's kind of odd, odd wordage. I think it's actually toughness. It's actually toughness. When you when you kneel kneel something, it doesn't really change the toughness. It it does deal with um, with stress relief. It does deal with recrystallization. It does deal with grain grain growth. Um, Here again, you're starting to get into metallurgy when you start talking about things like that. And we don't talk about that in our materials course. We don't get into it that deep. That's a material science type type question. Uh, this is a free one here if you got it on the test. The elastic modulus yield strength, ultimate tensile strength, and ductility of a metal can all be determined from elastic modulus, yield strength, ultimate tensile strength, and ductility of a metal can be determined from an endurance test, an impact test, a quenching test, a standard tensile test. Standard tensile test. That's a free one if you get that one, right? Which of the following may be a Poisson's ratio for a material? Negative 0 0.37, 0 0.25, 0 0.55, 1 1.5. And that's the question. It'll, that's, I mean, they could throw that one at you in two seconds. Tells you if they know anything about Poisson's ratio, right? Negative 0 0.37, 0 0.25, 0 0.55, 1.5. 0 0.25. Because it's between one half and, or it's between zero and one, it's zero and a half. Typically more between point, point one and point four. In the soils world, we're always about that point three, point three five range. Um, so you'd love to see one like that. It's easy, quick, easy, quick, and that's the way a lot of these end up being. What does the Sharpie and Sharpie test determine? Endurance, yield, strength, ductility, toughness. Toughness. Um, what in you know? Here's a unique way of phrasing it. What is the ratio of stress to strain below the proportional limit called? The modulus of rigidity, Hooke's constant, Poisson's ratio, Young's modulus. <coughs> Let's see what else we got here. Um,
Hmm. We're getting close to the end of the stack here, guys. And a lot of what these, a lot of these are going to be embedded in, in uh, in other problems this day, these days. Let me see if I can actually draw this. We're supposed to be able to do this kind of thing. Are we all impressed or what? I impressed myself with that. Um, oh, wasn't done. Wasn't done. O, O prime, this is plus two, this is plus one. D, C, E, F, G, and H. I believe I have it all. Um, for the stress strain curve of carbon steel shown, curve one is a plot of the true stress strain, the engineering stress strain, the tensile force versus elongation, modulus of elasticity is the true stress strain. The slope of the line OH is the true stress strain curve, an engineering stress strain curve, tensile force versus elongation, the modulus of elasticity. Modulus of elasticity. Um, curve three, uh, curve two is the engineering stress strain curve, correct? Um, the slope of the line OE is the secant modulus, proportional limit, yield point, or ultimate strength? The secant modulus. Random point on the curve, back to the origin. Point H indicates secant modulus, proportional limit, yield point, ultimate strength. Proportional limit. End of the, end of the linear, linear portion there, right? Point F indicates proportional limit, yield point, ultimate strength, the permanent set. Proportional limit, yield point, ultimate strength, the permanent set. Have you ever even heard that last one before? Cross it off. It's not D. Proportional limit, yield point, ultimate strength. Well, what's the ultimate strength? F. Where's, where's, where's the ultimate strength at? D. We know that's not it. We're down to two. What did we just say the proportional limit was? Solved it and you didn't even know what the answer was, right? That's actually the yield point. Actually the yield point. Well, that is, the G on that is going to be your point of um, elastic limit. You can go to G and then come back. You can go to G and come back. And my diagram is maybe not the greatest diagram in the world, but when you get up to that point and you're getting, you're getting stresses, you're getting strains without increasing stresses or decreasing stresses, that's yielding. So that's that yield point. If you had the diagram, it, it might be a little more clear. So it's a little hard to draw it on the screen. No, I think once you answer it, I think you're done. Now you can answer, you can. I think you can end it, you can, you can, I think you can mark an answer, but not like submit it, I think, or something like that. And unfortunately, you're asking the wrong guy. We can, I can ask, I can ask uh, one of the students who have already taken the exam. 
about, about clarification on that. And you might be able to find it on their website and explain how to take the test. Um, point D indicates the ultimate strength. Um, point C, fracture point, elastic limit, point, or ultimate strength. So it's going to be the fracture point. Mm -hmm. Ultimate's going to be D. Ultimate strength, right? Right, ultimate strength. Um, I didn't even put an X on there. Where's the X at? I don't see X on there. Oh, different diagram. Different diagram. Hmm. Anyway, going to the next page here. What are you talking about? I can draw it all day long. I thought when I did this, it would give me new. Oh, ah, there we go. I know one way of getting there. To zap it. All right. When in doubt, hit the power button, right? This is one colored area in here. There's another one underneath here. I ah, know. We don't have that kind of time. We all want to get home, right? Oh, mercy. Miss, mercy, mercy, mercy. We got an X and we got a Y. Uh, area X. Area X represents the modulus of elasticity, the modulus of resilience, the modulus of toughness, Young's modulus. Modulus of resiliency B. Y is the modulus of toughness. Modulus of toughness. And actually, I'm, I'm misrepresenting that. Y actually comes all the way down to here. Poisson's ratio is the ratio of the true stress to two strain, the lateral strain to la axial strain, shear stress to shear strain. Actually, it is lateral strain to la the axial strain. Most engineering work is based on engineering stress and strain rather than true stress and strain because engineering stress and strain is more accurate. Engineering stress and strain is easier to use. Design using ductile materials is limited to the elastic region where there is little difference. Reduction of cross-sectional area of parts at their service stress is well known due to Poisson's ratio, but it is needlessly complicated. Engineering stress, engineering strain is more accurate. Engineering stress strain is easier to use. Design under ductile materials is limited to the elastic region where there is little stress difference or little difference. Reduction in cross-section area of part at their service stress is well known due to the poison's ratio, but is needlessly complicated. C. C. Because we're all, C is design using ductile materials is limited to the elastic region where there's little difference. We don't want to take something out and get it beyond that plastic, in that plastic region, right? Because then we're getting crazy deformations. We don't like big deformations. We want to stay in that elastic region in there. And in that region, they're both the same as that curve. So it doesn't matter which one you want to say you're using. Um, we're, we're, they're going to give you the same result.
Top this all. Some questions again. Um, zero. Absolutely zero. Each of these questions got to be two, three minutes in length. I doubt it. I doubt it. You, you go, well, you might see the, the mixed water portion. You might see that little piece of it, but it's it, these are quick. These are boom, 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 boom. Um, you just don't have time. These are all the same questions over and over and over. Ah, a soft material, a soft material shows low ultimate strength, shows high ultimate strength, exhibits a low modulus of elasticity, yields little before breaking. A soft material shows low ultimate strength, shows high ultimate strength, exhibits a low modulus of elasticity, yields little before breaking. So if something yields little before breaking, what do we typically think that's going to be? It's going to be brittle. It's not soft. C. Exhibits low modulus of elasticity. A weak material, a weak material shows a low ultimate strength, a high ultimate strength, exhibits a low modulus of elasticity, and yields little before breaking. A, low ultimate. Low, a hard material shows the same exact, same exact answers. Shows low ultimate strength, shows high ultimate strength, yields little before breaking, exhibits a high modulus of elasticity. Hard. A hard material. Low low ultimate, high ultimate, yields little before breaking, or has a high modulus of elasticity. What would we just say on for the low one? It's gonna have high modulus of elasticity. The other one was low, right? Weak. Weak was low ultimate strength. We're talking about hardness here. I'm not talking about the, the brittle material shows low ultimate strength. Yields and these are these are tricky. These make these really determine whether you know what you're doing. A brittle material shows low ultimate strength, yields greatly before breaking, yields little before breaking, exhibits a high modulus of elasticity. Yields little before breaking. The division between cast iron and steel for carbon content is 0 0.1, 0 0.72, or 4.4. 2%. The division between cast iron and steel, structural steel, the dividing line is 0.2. Or I'm sorry, 2%. 2%. Um, Seeing the same thing over and over and over here again. Steel is an import is a is the most prevalent engineering material for all the following reasons except except so which one's not true? The abundance of iron ore, its low density, simplicity of production, predictability of performance. Low density, right? Low density. Steel is the most prevalent engineering metal, metal uh, because it's in abundance. It's, sim it's simple to produce. Well, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, compared to a lot of things. Predictability of its performance is known, but it does not have a low density. Unit weight of, unit weight of steel, 500 pounds per cubic foot. Massive, massive density.
All the following are common constituents of concrete except, except Portland cement, sand, aggregate, calcium chloride. Key there's common. Can you put calcium chloride in concrete? You do. Accelerates it if you accelerates it if you do, but it's not the common material. The ratio of one, two, three for a concrete mixture gives uh, the relative weights of which of the following constituents. So it's one, two, three. Cement, coarse aggregate, water. Cement, sand, and water. Cement, fine aggregate, coarse aggregate. Water, fine aggregate, coarse aggregate. Cement, fine, coarse. The addition of steel to concrete is primarily to increase material density, increase torsional strength, increase tensile strength, increase abrasion resistance. Increase the tensile strength. We're getting there. The use of admixtures hydrated lime, flash, etc. with concrete is to reduce weight, increase durability, improve workability, hardness, strength characteristics, accelerate curing. C. Workability, dealing with hardness. I hear about steel and, and recrystallization of steel, which doesn't do us any good. And a lot of the same questions over and over here. That's it. Got to the end of the book. Any questions in particular? Anything we can clear up before we get out of here? Glad you guys could show up. Good luck on the exam. I know you all will do just fine. No, you won't be able to bring anything in there. Uh, yeah, but.